Welcome again to church, everyone. It's good to see your bright, shining faces. Uh, we are working our way through a book series uh, today. So if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Good to have you with us. Uh, if uh, this is your regular service and you've been here for the last eight weeks, welcome also. Good, good, to, good to have you with us. So uh, if you want to open up to the book of Philippians, we're going to be flipping right there in just a second. Uh, but each week we're also, yeah, probably the best joke of the whole service. So get the laughs out right now. No. Uh, we've got some serious and, and some deep waters to talk about uh, today in, uh, in the book of Philippians, but we're, e we're also going to take a quick look at, at the background of the church in Philippi, because background matters. And so um, if we're going to look at the book and over the four different chapters of Philippians, uh, and I was reading another biblical author who said he likes to think of the four chapters in these categories. The first chapter sets up Christ as our life. Christ is our life. The second chapter, Christ sets us an example. Christ shows us the way to go. Third, as he is the object of our worship and praise. And the fourth one, Christ, our strength and our supply. I thought that was really neat as I was reading this week. Uh, it was uh, Ironside who divided it up that way and I thought it was fantastic. The church in Philippi, if you've not traveled uh, on the Mediterranean, which I have not, and maybe you have, maybe you've gone there more than I have. Uh, Philippi, there's still a, a modern town called Philippoi now, uh, where ancient Philippi was. And so uh, if you're looking there on our map right there, Philippi, it was on Paul's second missionary journey where the church was planted. And we're going to dive into another part of the story. So last week we started the story of Paul came and there was no synagogue to preach in. So he went down by the river and there were some women that were gathered to pray. And he preaches the gospel to them and Lydia opens up, gets her whole family baptized and, and the church comes to Philippi through, through Paul and through the work of Lydia. So that's kind of our background setup uh, right there by the river, Paul preaching the gospel, moving forward. But then some interesting things happen to Paul there in Acts chapter 16. And this is, this is his time as an early church planter in Philippi. So sometimes missions trips go exactly the way you want them to go, and sometimes the wheels come off. So uh, Acts chapter 16, we're going to be beginning in verse 16. One day we were in the place of prayer. We met a female slave who had the spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. So that doesn't sound good. That's, that's, not, uh, not, that's not off to a good start, Paul. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Imagine if someone walked behind you and everywhere you went, this is a servant of the most high God and he's proclaiming you the way of salvation. Like this gets annoying really fast, really quick, right? She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. You and I would be elated, right? Demon gone. Yes. How do, how do the people uh, respond to this? You'll be amazed. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, money, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them there before the magistrates, they said, these men... These Jews are disturbing our city, and they're advocating customs that are not lawful for us, being Romans, to adopt and observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing, ordered them beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them in prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. So this is Paul's mission trip to Philippi, going exactly as he had planned. <laughs> demon possession, casting out demons, planting the church, being publicly stripped, beaten, and imprisoned. So that's kind of the background of Paul's writing this letter from a different imprisonment, he's, where we believe he's probably in Rome. There's good good case for him being in Rome. He's in Rome, he's writing to them, and he's in prison again. Now, the, the Philippi, Philippian church has seen this before. So following these instructions, they put him in the inmost cell, and they fastened their feet in the stocks. And I thought, that's an interesting detail. Like, not only are you in the inner prison, and not only are you bleeding and broken and beaten and humiliated. Think of the last time that you were, like, soundly humiliated. I'm trying to think in my own head. I can't even remember the last time I was, like, like thoroughly, like, embarrassed, humiliated. That's Paul and, and Silas. And then, so that they would be very comfortable, they fastened their feet in the stocks in the inner prison. This is... This is where Paul and Silas are planting the church. So uh, I mentioned last week the jailhouse. We're pretty sure this is that jailhouse. 
uh, the, where the, the Philippian city would have locked their prisoners right there. Not very good source of light, right up against the hill. Interesting. So I want to circle back, and each time we open up the scriptures, this is our background reading, but I want us to look at how do we study the Bible? Because this is an important thing. Every time I open the Bible, there's three basic things that I want you to think through. I want, I want this to become like A, B, C for us. Just natural breathing for us. We open the word. I want us to read it and observe. Carefully look at the details. Like, like the detective, I want you to take out the magnifying glass or the spectacles if you must. And I want you to... to piece together, every little piece together, I want you to interpret or understand what is this passage trying to say to us carefully? What is, what is God's word saying to them in their day and to us in our day? And third, and maybe one of the most important steps that's often left off, how do we apply this to our lives today? We're going to go through that method every time we get together. So our book of Philippians, uh, we left off, uh, we were reading, we read the first 11 verses, and we talked about the things that we could see in the first 11 verses. We're going to begin in verse 12, and we've got a, a small passage we're going to uh, dive into together. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the progress of the gospel. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters have been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here on the defense of the gospel. And others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that this will turn out for my salvation. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not in any way, but that by my speaking with boldness, Christ will be exalted now and always in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. This is God's word. Love this passage of scripture, and there's such a beauty and a depth here. Wonderful exhortation. And so if we're to look at the, the whole passage, and we're to say there's, there's three basic things, the passage is going to, three main points the passage is going to make for us. The first thing is tragedy leading to gospel success. There's, again, Paul has found himself in an, uh, an imprisonment, in a not good circumstance. Paul's dealing with some really hard stuff, and he's going to show us how this has led to gospel success. He's going to talk about gospel rivalry. He's going to talk about competition between brothers and uh, his very unique perspective on that. And the last thing, and maybe something that is important for each of us to take away and to live out is living is Christ and dying is gain for the believer, we become invincible. I wouldn't say that lightly. If we have faith in Jesus, there's a sense in which we become not invulnerable, but invincible. So our first, first part, our first section, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the progress of the gospel. And so the lesson here is dealing with tragedy. Now, tragedy uh, strikes in a whole variety of ways. Sometimes we know something is coming. You know, we, we get a letter or we get clued into the fact that there is tragedy impending and we sweat over it and we, we, we labor over it and we're wor worried about it and we, we fear it. And then sometimes something just terrible happens and we just wake up one morning and our life will never be the same. Tragedy happens to us all. It will. Uh, whether you are Eric's age or whether you are 85 years old, tragedy comes to each one of us. And so Paul's going to show us in his perspective, how do we deal with tragedy and what is the outcome of the tragedy he's dealing with? Now, we're pretty sure that if, if the imprisonment from which he's writing this letter, and I'm saying pretty sure because we don't know exactly, but we have a very good guess, from Rome, he is being chained to a Roman guard night and day. So even when he wants to sleep at night, he is chained to a Roman guard. And not just a Roman guard, but like the Roman top guard, the Praetorian guard. 
These were like the elite guards. They were, they were paid double what a soldier is paid. They were so renowned and so fierce, and they got such a notoriety, the Praetorian Guard. The emperors, the emperors in Rome, would actually try and court. They'd actually try and grab the favor of the Praetorian Guard because they were in such high esteem. And these guys, these highly esteemed, uh, uh, trained killers, are being chained to Paul. Now, you and I would think, man, he's got to go to the bathroom, he's got to take a Praetorian guard with him. He's gonna, he wants to talk to someone, he's got to ask the Praetorian guard. He's, he's trying to eat his food. Imagine you've got the chain to your, your left hand, or left hand, or your right hand, and you're just about to eat, and the Praetorian guard goes, Fwah! and there goes your food. And you're trying to eat, and, Fwah! and the, have you ever been chained to someone night and day? You haven't been? I imagine it's not fun. This is the circumstance that Paul is under. He is chained to an elite guard. And his life is difficult. Even normal things are difficult for him. And yet, he sees this great opportunity because they can't get away from him. This is the Apostle Paul. And with a gospel lens, he says, well, if they can't get away from me, then I'm going to lovingly, carefully share the gospel. Every time they change out a guard, we're going to get him saved. We're, we're going to preach and love and exhort and be kind to even the mean and the vicious and the, the sadistic ones. We're going to love them into the kingdom. And spoiler alert, if we flip to the end of Philippians, one of the things that he says at the very end of the book is those in Caesar's household send their greetings. Now, why would Caesar's household send greetings to the church in Philippi? Because Paul's mission to win these men, these very hardened veterans for Christ, he's succeeding. He's succeeding at this mission. And we have to ask ourselves, Paul is under this, this horrible loss, loss of his freedom. He's under pain night and day. There's tragedy that's going on in his life. And each of us in time, and I know that there's a lot of us right now that whether it's you personally or someone that you know or love is going through tragedy. And it's hard for us when we're going through these things to see God's purpose in them. I uh, received this interesting puzzle cube. So some of you have been wondering, why is it here in, in front? Was it just my, my boys left it, left it here? But when we suffer and when we're going through, through pain and challenging times, we go through a process of grief that is sometimes a little bit like a puzzle cube. Anybody think, puzzle cube, what is that? It's a maze that's three-dimensional. And so you start in one place and you have to work your way around the puzzle cube to get to the end, and then it opens. But when it opens, it starts the puzzle cube all over again. Our grief can sometimes be like this. We, don't, we can't always predict how long is it going to take me to get through this cycle of grief. We, we can't predict how quickly we're going to get through it. And as much as we might want to say, well, just get through the cube already, you get through the cube and it starts again. And grief can sometimes be like that for us. A never-ending cycle. It just continues. We, we learn to live with it and to grow with it, and God uses it for our good, and it deepens us in a beautiful way. But it's frustrating when you're like, when is the, the, the trial and the confusion and the, you go the wrong way, and you're like, ah, oh, I don't even know which side of the puzzle cube I'm supposed to be on. Which cycle of grief am I even supposed to be in? And there isn't an easy way through. But we do this together. Something I want to encourage you, uh, brothers and sisters, don't grieve alone. We are with you. You are not alone. You're not in this alone. And not just because the Lord is with you, we are with you. And for us that are not going through grief right now, try not to solve the puzzle cube for them. Because as much as you might think, well, just spin it this way, it, it's not, not helpful to someone that's struggling in the cube of grief, in the confusion of grief. Spend time with them and love them and come alongside and ask them specifically what's going to help them in the cycle that they're in, where they're at, what is going to be helpful. That is what we do, the beloveds, in times of loss and pain and tragedy. And God will use it for good. Uh, I'm not going to put the scripture up on the screen, but if you want to look down at Acts 16, we started the message with reading about Paul's predicament in Philippi. And I'm going to read to you how does it end? How does Paul's predicament in Acts 16 end? 16, 25 through 34 says this. At about midnight... Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Here they are, in excruciating pain, and they're singing praise to God. Suddenly there was an earthquake, and, and it was violent, so violent the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself! 
We're all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At that same hour of night, he took them and washed their wounds, and he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. He and the entire household rejoiced that they had become a believer in God. That's how his gospel situation ends. So, publicly humiliated, beaten, locked up in as m such an uncomfortable circumstance. I mean, think about having your, your, your legs restrained, you're on your back, you're bleeding, and what are they doing? They're worshiping God. And God uses... Now, ask yourself, what earthquake opens up all the doors and undoes all the shackles? A God-sized earthquake. God can do that, and God will do that. But that doesn't mean that every time we come to a challenge that God is going to magically swing open the doors, but that he will go with us. And we see this amazing act of God rescuing the Philippian jailer and his whole family. Uh, what a neat thing that God takes a tragedy, an ugly, messy, horrible tragedy, and turns it for the good of the city. I imagine, as the, 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 the jailer for the whole city, that he treated his prisoners a little differently as a believer. I imagine he had quite an impact on people that, that society could care less for. I imagine there was great gospel fruit from this, Paul and Silas being faithful to endure the difficulty that they came. Now, if we jump back to our passage in Philippians, and we're kind of comparing and contrasting the challenge we had in Acts when the church was born, and the challenge that Paul's in right now, you might think, Paul's locked up, and, and he's locked up on behalf of Christ. There's three things I see in the text, and that I kind of sleuth out, that God uses for good. And God can take those evil things that happen in our life, those senseless things, and can and will use them for good. In this case, the Praetorian Guard comes to faith. The prisoners that are ch chained, that are shackled to Paul, we find out that many of them come to know Jesus. Now, is it a one-to-one -one relation? Every time they sent someone to him, he became a believer? I don't believe so. But you'd be amazed what a couple uh, well-placed believers will be able to do. The believers who are around him are emboldened to share their faith. You'd think it would have the exact opposite effect that Paul is being locked up for his faith, you'd think that people would be like, I'm definitely going to hide. If they're going to lock up Paul, they'll lock up me. No. Believers are sharing their faith all the more openly when they see Paul succeeding even from behind bars. And lastly, the gospel is preached and, and Paul rejoices. It, yes, the gospel is preached. And so I want to ask you, in your circumstance right now, because I know, I know for a fact that some of you are going through such a hard time and I don't want to belittle that because I know that, that we're in a, a process of grieving together as a family with some of the difficult things that are going on. I got three sets of, of heart-rending news from people that, that I know and that I love outside of our fellowship this week. Let us together pray that God will take those awful circumstances and turn them around for good because he can and he will. Sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly, God will use all of these things for good when we put them into his hands. But let's also be sensitive to people that are in pain and not try and give them shallow answers, but love them and walk alongside them. That's what we, the beloved, who are not going through pain right now, get to do. And so our passage continues, some proclaim Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. And this lesson, as I'm looking at it, there was one church in Philippi. And even with just one church, we've got some rivalry going on. Others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely intending to increase my suffering and imprisonment. They want to make Paul's imprisonment worse by preaching the gospel. Now, one, I don't think they had a good grasp of who Paul is, because by preaching the gospel, he's going to tell the Philippians, yes, preach the gospel, good. But they think that they can harm him by preaching the gospel. What does it matter? Just that this, Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. And so we have to ask ourselves, when we come to our own church family and other churches close to us, are we competing against them? Are we in rivalry with them? Or uh, are we in a tug of war, right? Uh, I call this a zero-sum game. In a tug of war, 
one side wins and one side loses, there is no other way. Or if you're thinking about a chess game, a chess game ends, you succeed at someone else's expense. Is the kingdom really like this? Do we compete with other churches in this way? And the answer is no, we do not. We love and we bless and we help. And, and I think something that we miss here is humility is, is what we need to have when it comes to dealing with other churches and love. Because as they succeed, the kingdom succeeds. So in every possible way, we are to help and assist the church. And I don't mean our church, I mean the church. Believers everywhere, we are to love them. Uh, Paul goes on, and as he's thinking through these things with the Philippians, he says, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that my, by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now and always in my body, whether by life or by death. He's praying for more boldness. Paul isn't praying for ease or comfort or for things to go the way that he wants them to go. He's praying for a bolder voice that he can continue to proclaim the gospel, whether by life or by his death. Historically, we know that Paul will be executed in Rome. They will take him out of the city because they don't want the execution to happen in the city where it could cause a riot, could cause a stir. Uh, two, two executioners will take him uh, a distance out of the city and unceremoniously they will chop off his head and end this amazing man's life. And I imagine, and this is me imagining, I can't, I can't back this up, so don't, don't say, Pastor Daniel said, I believe that with those two men in his last breath, he was encouraging them. I bet you he looked them dead in the eyes and said, I know exactly where I'm going. When you kill me, I will be with Jesus, which is far better. But I worry for you because you're staying here in this ugly world where people are beheaded and where Christians are burned as torches. And I bet you he used his last breath to reach out and to give the gospel to the two men that were about to behead and kill him. Now, church tradition, which we can't always rely on it like we can scripture, church tradition says that both people that were in, involved in his execution gave their lives to Christ and became believers almost immediately after killing the Apostle Paul. Rats, I wish they'd like come to faith right before killing him, like that would, how that could have been. But God uses tragedy for good, and it requires humility for us to say, God, what do you want of me in this circumstance? And when we're dealing with other churches, and when we're dealing with rivalry, both personal rivalry or church rivalry, we need to say, I'm going to lay my ego on the altar and say, God, what do you want? Because the kingdom of God is way more beautiful and big and broad than, than our small imaginings of this is what we want in our church, in our ministry, in our life. We've got to start opening our eyes to the kingdom at large. And you'd be amazed how many wonderful believers there are. They're like, oh my goodness, I didn't even realize that my co-worker is a believer. And that there, there are faithful believers all over St. Helens. This last part, and the lesson that I wanted to end on, and it's so important that we grab a hold of this. For, me, for to me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. This is hard for us to understand, to grapple with. And the, the lesson I call here is living for Christ. Because of the two, if we were to die right now, we're with Jesus. And Paul will later say that that is a much better thing. To be with Jesus is absolute perfection. It's actually harder to live for him than to die for him right now. It's easy to take a bullet right now, die and be with Jesus. But to say, I'm going to make every single day a living sacrifice. For to me, living is Christ. Everything that I am, the, the whole of my being, all of, of my difficulty and my challenge and my grieving and all of my devoted life and all of my finances and all of my relationships, everything I am living is Christ. I keep nothing back from him. Nothing, nothing, nothing. To live is Christ. And to die is gain. To die is the cherry on the top. To die is to say, I step from one state of being where I am frail and have foibles and mess things up and, and have impure thoughts and struggle and, and, you know, even my dogs trip me up from time to time. Some of you know why that's funny. Some of you can ask me later. Everything I am, I live for him. And when I die, I get to step into perfection in his presence. 
and say, Lord, I did the very best I could to live for you as my life is yours. Living is Christ. And dying is just a bonus. Not that we would speed it on. Uh, I was talking to a, a young believer the other day. They're like, well, wh why didn't... Uh, forgive me, this is a very, very young believer. So <laughs> you're going to be like, ooh. <laughs> why is it that when we bring someone to Christ, we don't just like murder them immediately? Like we bring them to Christ and then we just murder them and send them to... It's like, no, 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 no. I, I very carefully... <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. I'll show you why we don't murder people after bringing them to Christ. You gave your life to Christ? Great, come with me this way. <laughs> no. <laughs> Is a believer far away? Don't worry. <laughs> you guys are safe. But to say, they had grabbed onto a truth and misapplied it. A misapplied truth is a problem. To say, we get to live for him. What an amazing joy that I get to live this day, this moment, here on this stage, in St. Helens, for Jesus. What a privilege it is that I get to do this Christian walk with each one of you. And that we get to know each other and encourage each other and strengthen each other, pray for each other, love each other. There's a couple verbs in there. Living is Christ, and dying is gain. And so I need to remind us that salvation is purely and entirely God's work. We can't do it. It's not something that we can do. I, I said save someone. We can't save anyone. I have to remind myself to be careful with my verbiage. It is Jesus that saves. It is what he did for me on the cross, why I am worth anything. I've been listening. Some of you may know the song. You, maybe you heard it on Christian radio. Um, uh, Lauren Daigle's new song about uh, if I didn't know you, I don't know who I would be. Like, I have no idea who I would be if I didn't have you. I'd probably fall off the edge. Like, her, she's, she, you should probably listen to the song. It's beautiful. I'm, I'm butchering it terribly. Listen to the song. It's gorgeous. It's a wonderful one. Lauren Daigle, and, and it's her latest one. And she's wearing this, like, huge flowery thing on her head. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. I, I don't know who I'd be. But I'll be honest, as I'm listening to, I've been listening to the song for almost two weeks, over and over and over again, because it's got this beautiful outcry of saying, Lord, who would I be without you? And she says, I don't know who I'd be. And for me, I'm like, I know who I'd be, and it scares me who I would be without Jesus, because that picture is awful. My life without Jesus is self-centered. What can Daniel get? What can Daniel gain living only for Daniel? That's life without Jesus is selfish, self-centered, taking. Life with Jesus is learning to be a giver, learning to love and accept what he did for me on the cross as a completed work. On the cross, he said, to telestai, it is paid in full. It is finished. Your sin is wiped clean. You are loved. Now, it's time for us to do some work together. So I'm going to uh, call the, the worship team up and we're going to pray. And if you need to take, uh, take a moment uh, and refresh your walk with him, as, as the, the band is coming up uh, behind me, uh, we're going to pray together uh, a prayer of both refreshing and a prayer of dedication to say, Lord, if I've not been on the path that you want for me, put my feet on the path that is yours. Because I don't want, I know who I'd be without you, and it's ugly. And I want all of you, Jesus, and all of what you have. Let's pray together, if you'll bow your heads. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for your word. And I thank you how it, how it speaks to us this morning and how I couldn't have timed it better. There's so much hurt going on in our world. We don't have to look further than, than our own lives and our own circles for such pain, Lord God. And I pray for those that are that are in that cube of, of grief and loss and pain. And Jesus, may your hand of mercy and healing be upon them. Lord God, I pray for those that are afraid. And I pray that you would speak those same words as you calm the storm. Your words of love, your words of peace, your words of healing, and your words of perfection. Jesus, I pray for our beloveds who've not been on track with you whose feet have walked down the, down the enemy's path, down the, the enemy's sucker trail, and have gotten lost in the woods. I pray, Lord God, that they would today, this moment, ask you to find them and bring them back onto your path. I pray for purity of heart and intention for us. I pray that you would place in us a love for you, Jesus. For those that don't know you yet, I pray that they would pray a simple prayer of faith and say, Lord Jesus... I want to be your child. I thank you for what you did on the cross for me. 
Forgive me for my wrongdoings. Accept me as your child. Protect me, Lord God, from the ways of the world. And help me to walk in your reliable, ancient paths. Jesus, we thank you so much for all of this and all that you do in our midst. And I pray for an outpouring of love and support for those who need it, Lord God. In your name we pray. Amen. So we like to close down our service with a blessing. So if you're unfamiliar with that, that's okay. We'll bless you anyway. Uh, this one comes right here in Philippians, in chapter 1. This is the blessing that came out of last week. And so um, stretch out a hand. And I pray that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what really matters so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Be blessed this Sunday, beloved. Have a wonderful one.